the effort continues. The struggle against the hunger and poverty. By showing an example, showing how it can be done. We farmed here last year. At that time, we were able to exert ourselves to a certain degree and depended mostly on the traditional method of rice production. From the rich archive of experience we acquired, we've been able to apply all of that and the difference is absolutely impressive. I mean, the yield this year, the, of course, the vastness of the, of the land, we expanded. And to be here is to witness something of great joy and, and satisfaction. And I come back to my point. Why is everyone not doing this? Everyone should be doing this. Every Nigerian who can afford to do this. It doesn't matter where you go. If you have a hectare of land, half a hectare of land, wherever, go and do this. In Ebony State, we've been able now to drive rice down. The price of rice, 25 kg of rice is now between 4,000, 4,500, 5,000 at most, which means that a bag of rice is at most 10,000 now. That was the achievement that was promised sometime last year by the government of Ebony State. And by the time all the larger efforts, such as ourselves, bring our products into the market, we're going to depress that price even a bit more. This field has surpassed itself. And I keep wondering, we have the EFCC, the NIA, the ICPC, the C. B, B, um, or rather no, the CCB, that is the Code of Conduct Bureau. We have the Nigerian police, we have the custom, we have immigration, we have a vast array of national institutions, creations of law, that are dedicated to the fight against crime in this society. I could even add the military, even though their primary assignment is the defense of the territory integrity of the country, but more often than not in our current society, they are deployed to fighting crime. We have all these great, permanent, first-line charge institutions fighting against crime. Where are the institutions fighting against hunger? I want to know that. Institutions created simply to fight hunger. Why do we not have, for instance, a federal agency responsible for fighting against food shortages. Let's call it FIA, Food Intelligence Agency. Such an agency would, for instance, be responsible for discovering that there are people in a place called the Bonnie State that are making this effort. Because what is happening here is not in the national statistics of rice production. It is not. And yet, this is not our biggest effort. Our biggest effort is somewhere in the co-local government. This is initially local government. This is a government-owned land, as a matter of fact, which had lain fallow for decades previously. And we thought it was such a waste of resources, and then we embarked on this. Our biggest effort lies somewhere else, but nobody, nobody, not the Ministry of Agriculture, at the federal level, not any agency responsible for food production in the country knows about the existence of individuals and communities that are waging extraordinary effort to make sure that we banish hunger in our society. A food intelligence agency would, for instance, make a case over there is a strategic grain reserve. We have many of us, uh, we have many of such across the country. I've been making the case that such a facility should be handed over to the government of states that are serious about food production. The latest information coming to us is that that wonderful facility has been concessioned into private hands. It shouldn't be. Such an agency, for instance, would be the first to alert 
the government of Nigeria, for instance, that hunger was about to threaten the patriots of the northeast of Nigeria. It will require such an agency to simply know that once you begin to gather large populations into a restricted area, refugees, the so-called internally displaced people, that the next priority is how are you going to find the food to feed these people? Before shelter, before sanitation, etc. It is the food. And if we have strategic grain reserves, and I'm certain there are so many located in the northeast of Nigeria, why do we have the crisis we have there to the point that Nigeria now faces the international humiliation of having food brought in from outside the world, outside the country, to help feed those? Why is it that it is the Guardian of London, it is the Washington Post, it is the Times of London, and the economists that are now pointing out to us, writing editorials about the food shortages and food crisis in the northeast of, north of Nigeria. How many Nigerian newspapers have done editorials on that? I, I really would like an answer to that. How many news agencies have done their editorials, way, be it radios, or televisions, and so on? I want to know the sort of effort we have paid to that state of emergency, affecting millions of citizens. Because until we stop talking with the surface, at the surface, scratching the surface of the challenges we face in this country, we cannot provide the solutions to them. A food intelligence agency, and this is an argument I'm making very seriously, is sorely needed in this country, not just to have reliable statistics of the food production capacity, those that are actually doing what we're doing now, but other efforts that could be made in other areas, in animal husbandry, in the production of cassava, production of tomatoes and potatoes. There was a time not too long ago in this country when the shortage of tomatoes became such embarrassment and it took us by surprise. Every single thing about food shortage in this country tends to take us by surprise. And the citizens pay a terrible price because of that laxity. Food intelligence agency, manned by people who understand what it means to guard against food scarcity, to make preparations for emergencies, but above all to put our resources to the best use. Now, I would also want the federal government to give us an answer as to why only NPK fertilizer was subsidized in this farming season. How about the other components? Because the NPK variety is only one tiny component of every single thing you need to embark in agriculture. Why not subsidize gas? Call it diesel. Why not subsidize diesel for us? Subsidize urea, the other type of fertilizer, which apparently the national guideline is for every hectare you have, you should apply six bags of fertilizer, four NPK, two urea. Why subsidize just the NPK and not the urea? Because this year, across the entire country, in most parts of the country, a bag of urea sold for between 8,000 to 9,500 naira, a bag of 50 kg. How do you make profit in those circumstances? Diesel was selling at about 200, 205 naira, 210 naira at the time we were embarking on field preparation. And that compared people like myself to invest all my machinery in preparing more than 400 hectares of land for free for people from my community because they could not afford to pay commercial operators to do that for them. And by the way, a food intelligence agency should have such efforts in their statistics because there should be a way of making sure that every country, every part of the country understands what effort other parts are making so that we learn from the best practices. Politicians should not should stop going on their knees begging for bags of rice to send to their constituents. Politicians who have the resources should buy tractors for those people you're sending your, your bags of rice with knees on ground and the bowl in your hands and stop dramatizing things that should be actually systematized. Buy the tractors, buy the fertilizers, subsidize the pesticides, the insecticides, and so on. Talking about pesticides, over there are tapes, anti-bird tapes, which were applied across the farm to ensure that not one single grain of this rice be touched. You can hear the sounds of bird all over the place. In fact, that tree is colonized by over 10,000 weaver birds, but none of them touches the rice because of those tapes. My conclusion about all of this is, yes, it's all very well to run around talking about zero hunger. 
But who is going to bring the hunger to zero? What are we doing to bring the hunger to zero? And we should stop, really, seriously, stop this notion that, oh, there must be someone out there doing it. There must be a group of people out there doing it. No, it's you, it's me. The patriots of this republic are the ones that must get out there in the field, be under the sun, be under the rain. Sacrifice your comfort zone. This is a Saturday evening. I have friends waiting to have an evening of relaxation, a weekend relaxation with me, but this is important because we are the vanguards against the wolves, the wolves of hunger, the wolves of poverty at the gates. One grain of rice, one seed of rice produced all of this. Because what we did was that we broadcast rice uh, in all our farms because the labor that will be required to do transplanting is just impossible. And we haven't yet got the technology that would enable us to do large fields under mechanized process. Now, what is fascinating about this is I counted this. There are 46 branches. Let me not use the technical term. They call it tillering. When it forms into branches, the experts call it tillering. I call them branches. If one grain, one single grain of rice could produce this, there are about 46 or is it 48, I counted, one stand alone. Why is this important? Because the Holy Grail is the attainment of five to six metric tons of rice per hectare. Now, the personal experiments I've been conducting shows me that unless you have this, because after the tillering, each one produces what they call panicles. This is it. Until one, one branch, again, let me talk in conventional language. If one branch could give us something as large as this, a cluster of one panicle has to be this large. That is the only point at which we produce five, six, or even seven metric tons per hectare of land. And that is a very challenging achievement to attain, particularly in upland, because effectively what we have here is upland. But what is also very tragic is that the body of literature on rice production, particularly from Nigerian agriculturists, is so poor, is so incredibly technical and academic. I think it's something they do uh, for projects in the universities and at the end of it, it does not translate to the field. So we came here, we just selected a small portion of land here. And I'm, if, you, if you take a look at it, all of this, going as far as the eye can see, we're experimenting to see if we can attain that holy grail of five, six, seven metric tons per ton. To achieve that in Upland is a great ask. Now, I have a rice field somewhere in Nikko where I think we can actually hit six metric tons. But that is a very small portion of land. To do it in a large commercial scale is the key. If we can produce that cluster from one branch of rice, you're on your way. So we see how that goes. Um, this holds a lot of promise, but I think this is on its way to being maybe four metric tons or thereabouts. There are patches, but of course right now we are challenged by the sudden end to the rainy season. We have not had rain now for about seven days, and today is the 28th of October, and the anxiety is building because very soon now we'll hit the Hamatan. But of course, all hope is not lost in those circumstances because another great help from nature is that it brings us what is called dew. Two days ago, there was so much dew. The precipitation, the, 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 the concentration of the precipitation in the atmosphere was so heavy, it eventually descended like scattered rainfall, the showers, a little bit. So with that, once the rice is at this stage, you can actually hope that it will use that to completed cycle of, you know, uh, yielding, maturing, and hopefully giving us proper solid grains and not chaffs. Those are the experiments we're doing here. But you see, what is heartbreaking about it is this. The infrastructure for irrigation is another area that the government of Nigeria should give a priority. Identify serious-minded people, each of them with a thousand, two thousand hectares of land. 
this land, there's no reason why we cannot farm here three times a year. So that it becomes a little less important whether you are able to attain six, seven metric tons a year, than that you constantly churn out the produce. That is doable. I keep emphasizing the point that east of the Niger, the largest body of water, apart from the Niger itself, is Cross River. On the bank of the Cross River, you could feed the entire southern Nigeria, and this is no exaggeration, with rice, or vegetables, or cocoa yam, or potatoes, or tomatoes. You could do all of that. It's an extraordinary natural resource. Lying waste has lain waste since eternity. That shouldn't be. We have well over 3,000 hectares of land here. Not all of it under rice cultivation. In fact, not all of it under cultivation of any kind. But if you just take a thousand and take forward, extend our experimentation to see what is possible in this wonderful place. Because with a passion, just, just try and see what Bryce is doing here. Just manage there. Just see if you can zoom in and do This cluster here, this cluster, there is no reason why even this cluster is replicated across the field. There's absolutely no reason why we cannot have over five metric tons. And then, and then all of that, the, this section of land, we have 30 hectares of land where we have subjected the experimentation of attaining five to six metric tons. It's coming up. It's coming up. Each stand of rice here is between 40 to 50 branches, the, the tillers. Very impressive. And yet, another great challenge is we had to broadcast rice here three times. The first round did not germinate. Second round did not germinate. And when I'm talking about pouring rice, we're pouring millions of naira. Hundreds of bags of rice did not germinate. Hence, We've just come from the field where we now are approaching uh, the period of harvest. The same period. All of this started at the same period. And yet, here is just tillering. That place is ready for harvest. We need certified, and when I say certified, scientifically, objectively, honestly, and truthfully certified rice seeds. This little cluster of rice. This, what, um, two meters by two by two meters, more or less. I guarantee you, if this is to be replicated across one hectare, this is effectively what it takes to produce five to six metric tons a hectare. That's the experiment. But you see, that's what happens in universities. It can only succeed when a tiny little space is dedicated to that sort of experimentation and therefore we're given the impression it is easy to do this, do that, it's not easy. What we've done to create this scenario with broadcast rice, this is not transplanted rice. If you look at it, you just know that there is something extraordinary going on here. If it, if, if it spreads across one hectare, it gives you minimum six to seven 